I'm Tony Moore, U.S. correspondent for Glow Time Radio, and today I'll be talking with Dr. Eric Davis. Dr. Davis is president at Indiana Counselors Association on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, adjunct professor at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, IUPUI, and also the co-owner and director at the Life Recovery Centers in Indianapolis. What sort of, uh, what sort of people do you see, Eric? Basically, what the clients that we see are split into four different areas. There's substance abuse, mental health, problem gambling, and domestic violence. It's primarily okay. substance abuse, though. We, we really did just start out in 2004 as a drug and alcohol outpatient rehab, mm-hmm. and then the services kind of grew through the years to include the three other areas. And this is something that I think a lot of our listeners in the U.K., can attribute to people that they know. Would you say, Eric, that this is a growing problem or has it always been there and at last people are beginning to recognize it as something that can be dealt with professionally? I, I think it's exactly the, you know, the latter thing you said. I think it's always been here. Sometimes societal views change on uh, different drugs. Addiction is a problem that has been around since the beginning of time. I'm certain of it. And I think that finally it's starting to get the attention that it deserves. Yes, and I know that um, one of the things that people in the UK find difficult to understand is that, you know, health care, certainly in England, is is, not free, but it is for everyone. It's universal. So things like mental health are kind of covered, you know, whether you think it's brilliant or not brilliant, at least they are covered. Here, I think, for years, mental health has never been covered by insurance companies. And so it's really been left for people to find their own way through, which has been a disaster for them. How do they come and see you? What's the steps that it takes to get to you? Well, usually it's, most of our clients are legally referred, so they would go through the legal system, and it would basically be um, a judge ultimately telling them, you know, as a stipulation of your probation or whatever it is, you will complete treatment. It kind of goes against the basic principles of treatment, if you think about it. I mean, it's Because they're being forced to come. Yeah, they're, being for, they're, yeah. they're forced uh, patients. So they call the office, make an appointment, they come in and we do a clinical diagnostic assessment to figure out what exactly is going on and fill out enrollment paperwork if they're uh, deemed necessary or if treatment's deemed necessary. And then at that point, they go through the, our milieu of treatment. I get the point that, you know, it's one of those things that you want people to want to come. But isn't it so that, I mean, at least they're here and at least you get a chance to work with them that otherwise maybe they wouldn't have at all. So at least there's something good there. Now, when I met with you before, uh, you very kindly asked me to come and talk to a group of your your clients. And one thing that stuck out with me, as you were going around talking to them, I got the clear sense that they really didn't feel that they belonged here and this was a waste of time. Is that pretty much the way it is when they come? A lot of times, yeah. Sadly enough, one of the symptoms of the disease of addiction that we treat is denial. I mean, that's Mm. that's just a fact. Some of them are, you know, drug abusers or, um, you know, drinkers who made a poor choice and really wouldn't fit the criteria for addiction per se. So there's a lot of resistance that we do have to deal with. But like you were saying earlier, the message is always the same, and kind of our approach is, you know, okay, we understand that you don't want to be here, but let's try to do something with you while you're mm. here. Yes, and I know that when um, I was talking to them, that was pretty much what I said to them, you know, so you're here. If you're going to spend a couple of hours a week here or a couple of hours several times a week or whatever is required, you may as well make it work for you. But some of them are not in that frame of mind. They're still combative. But there's a very serious note now. Um, what do you consider to be um, a success in this? Basically, obviously, our goal is complete total recovery, which, mm. which means abstinence from all mood-altering substances and a person feeling happy, joyous, and free. We try to judge success on any improvements that are made at all. Some people come in and they, they're lying and lying and lying, and then they tell the truth through there. That must be an emotional part for them when finally they're, they're telling the truth. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that when a person gets honest, that's really where we start to see the changes take mm-hmm. place. One of the things that I'm very proud of is, is our alumni program. So when a person completes their treatment with us as, and, and becomes an alumnus of our program, they can come back free of charge for nothing. They can come and sit in on group. We offer that as a way of support. So that's one of the things that I think shows 
a success in my eyes is when I see individuals come back. They show up here, and it's always good to see them. Yes, absolutely. Now, you're a doctor. You're a doctor of, of addiction counseling, and you've studied this at, at length. Are there any things that you see that kind of trigger someone to become an addict, whether they want to or not? Yeah, I, I think the biggest part is there's definitely a biological component. You know, in looking at the biology of addiction, there's definitely a hereditary line that becomes evident extremely often. I'm a firm believer, though. I think if you have a person who is, I don't know, for example, say ultra-religious or something, and mm -hmm. just believes, you know, is raised in a family that they believe that drinking is an absolute sin and they never touch a drop of alcohol in their entire life, they may be a, a chronic alcoholic underneath the surface, but they've never opened Pandora's box, so they would never know. That's interesting because uh, I've been associated with people, as, as many of us, and, and I've got to say, you know, to all our listeners on Glow Time, um, I would guess that every one of you listening to this will know of someone that has a problem with, with addiction of one sort or another. But there are other types of addiction, aren't there? Yeah. Typically, society as a whole looks at addiction as being chemical dependency. When I talk about addiction, what I'm talking about are the thoughts and behaviors that exist after the person is no longer chemically dependent, the things that take them back to using again. We've had individuals come through here, a few of them that were addicted, to, that was their thing, they were addicted to gaming, video mm. games. Wow. You, know, you would yeah. say they were just nuts, you know, they're just nuts always on it, but I, I guess, yes, I can see that it is a form of addiction. Mm -hmm. Is it like, is it something in their genealogy that makes people more susceptible to addiction than less susceptible? Is it always there in their genes and it's just a matter of finding the right thing that triggers that? I, I really, to some extent, yeah, I believe so. Mm. I really do. Um, I think that people are just biologically predisposed. You know, now the good news is whether a person's biologically predisposed or not, it does not have to destroy their life. There is help out there. There are ways to, you know, survive it and to get mm. better and, and to live a, a happy, joyous, and free life. But there definitely is a biological component to it. How many people do you think you've, you've helped? Oh, man. I know it's a tough one. I thought I was going to ask you that at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the field for about 15 years now. Mm-hmm. I mean, like at this time, Life Recovery Center probably has around 250, 300 clients. So mm -hmm. it's probably thousands, I hope. Yeah. You know, I hope. I hope it's millions yeah. before I stop. And it must be, even though it's very frustrating, I remember when, um, when I'd finished speaking to uh, some of your clients, uh, you and I spoke, and I said, you know, what do you consider to be a success? And you said to me, if I get one person out of this, yeah. out of a group of 10 or 15, if I can get one, really converted away from it, that for me is a great success. Absolutely. It, it gets tough because like we talked about, a lot of clients, especially the ones that are legally referred, which are most because in the United States, addiction has been criminalized. Yes. You know, so, we're, so we're locking people up for having a devastating illness, and I could talk about that all day. Yeah, you and I, we, we have yeah. talked, and I, I absolutely agree, you're, you're here, you're preaching to the choir yeah. on that one. And I think in a lot of European countries, it's not criminalized. They, no, it, they, it, when they determine that this person is a serious addict, the good side is they get put into a place that can help them. The bad side is they're going to stay there until they are helped. Uh, so <laughs> to your point about many of them yeah. coming in, you know, because they're, they're forced to come here, I see from, um, you know, a very interested but not involved in it, that just to get them here is a huge step in the right direction. Yeah, it really is. And that's, you know, the denial, if you can help, and that's what, that's what I was saying, if I can help one person break through that denial and say, okay, you know what, I'm going to do this, I want to get better, that really is a huge success. Yeah. So I try to stay as involved as I can mm. because that's why I went into this field. I didn't go into this field to be a businessman. You know, no, I went into no. this field to help folks. So I can't imagine that this is a business that you would go into if you want to become a millionaire or no, a No, no, not, not even close. <laughs> There's a lot of things like <laughs> being a radio presenter, for example. That would be a lot easier than doing this. But um, it was interesting to see the dynamic and um, with your partner, Tom, is it? Yeah, his name's Tom. Yeah, your Tom partner. Tom guest. Yes, Tom was uh, running the session, that the, one of the sessions that I was in, and he was just listening and going around methodically. And the funny thing is that, they think they're being kind of smart, especially the young ones that are there yeah. as a ward of court. You know, you've got to go do this. And he penetrates them with his questions, just yeah. gently penetrating. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's kind of impossible to try and disguise the, the truths of what they see here. 
And what I found interesting was that it was it was for me a very a very positive thing. The atmosphere at the beginning and the atmosphere at the end. I just wish we could go on longer with the sessions Absolutely. because I think if the graph keeps going up, they're going to come out smiling and and be very very happy. I th- you know we see clients who you know come through one time and wind up you know either having a relapse or getting in trouble again for some reason. And they, a lot of times they do come back by choice. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, my hope is that individuals that come through here, that they at least acknowledge that we're doing the best we can yeah. for them. So let me ask you, Eric, then, how much of the environment around them, having a girlfriend, a wife, a family, having some sort of support system there, whether it's just friends that they can talk to, how important is that as part of this process? It is uh, indispensable. The support that people have, that's really a lot of what we do is we teach an individual how to build a recovery support network. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a joke that we in the field say, we say, you know, well, you only have to change one thing in recovery. You know, what is it? Everything. And I remember being in grade school and, you know, learning about nouns, which are things, you know, mm-hmm. they're people, places, and things. So it's kind of like, wow, I need to change people, places, and things. I mean, I need to change all the nouns in my life and a lot of the verbs too so that's very interesting people places and things that's Mm -hmm. everything what kind of difference does it make if they say well i think i really need to move away from here to start my recovery you know sometimes sometimes that can be a good thing but what happens a lot of times is we call that the geographical cure Mm -hmm. you know and if you take someone who has diabetes and move them to another state they just move to another state and they still have diabetes so if they are continuing to treat the problem, that may not be a bad thing at all. But they have to have a support network, and they have to have some sort of a program of recovery, or, yes. or nothing's going to change. Yeah, they'll just find their the same level there, except now they're in a brand new surrounding, and they don't have a support network of people exactly. that are familiar to them. Well, Dr. Eric, it's absolutely fantastic what you're doing, and uh, I see it as totally relevant uh, for all the people that are listening. And I have to say that that my my friends and colleagues and family in the UK, they don't realize how lucky they are to have a system that treats this as as a sickness, as a disease, which it is. And we're not there yet, but I know um, Ted Kennedy, uh, before he sadly passed away, spent most of his life trying to get the treatment of mental illness on the books as something that medical establishments and insurance companies would would treat. And I think he really opened the door for a lot of this now. I agree. We are starting to see trends toward treating addiction as a disease rather than a moral deficiency or a crime yeah. in that, you know, things such as drug courts or um, recovery courts that with the new healthcare system here Basically, that was a big deal for substance abuse because it has to be taken care of. Yes, it does. Whereas before, it was kind of optional. Well, Eric, it was fantastic talking to you, and I hope that everybody listening to this can take something away from this, that there are people like you, thank God, that are working with this every day and, and making a difference. So thank you very, very much. My pleasure. This is Tony Moore, your U.S. correspondent, saying goodbye to Glow Time Radio. And Eric, would you like to say goodbye to all our listeners all over Absolutely. the world? Absolutely. Goodbye to Glow Time Radio. I love you all. You're awesome. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.